Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Veronica Wawaru, a visiting scholar in the Council on African Studies at the Macmillan Center. She is an archaeological anthropologist whose research interests cover prehistoric technological change and innovation in our species, Homo sapiens. Her work focuses on prehistoric projectile weaponry from the Kenya Highlands in the latter Pleistocene. Her work was featured in the PBS documentary, The Human Spark. Her current project focuses on the use of poison-assistant hunting using projectile technology by early humans. Today we'll talk with Professor Wawaru about her current project in Yapan, Kenya. Welcome, Professor Wawaru. Thank you. So let's start with um, the site. What drew you to it? I heard about the site from uh, my colleagues in the Nairobi Museum, mm -hmm. and they were not exactly sure what was going on. A farmer had called them in and said, um, there's some funny looking rocks here, oh. um, can you come over? Mm -hmm. And they get a lot of these reports, so you really don't get too excited until oh. you're out there. They went, they checked the place out and they found out that it, it was a site. Mm -hmm. And, but they did not have somebody who works in the older, um, with older archaeological material. Okay. So when I was there, I said, can I come along? And they said, sure. Mm -hmm. And so we went out there, and it turned out to be a very, very exciting site. Okay. And how long ago was this when the first discovery was made? Um, this, I believe, was made in April of last year. Oh, okay. So fairly recent. Fairly recent, Okay, yeah. so... Um, the work you're doing also there is, is not um, the traditional kind of work. How is it different from um, other work that's been done? Um, right now we haven't carried out a lot of work, but um, the way we've started it, it's, it's going to be both traditional and non-traditional. Okay, so it's, tell us about the non-traditional. Um, let me explain the traditional first. Okay, <laughs> okay. good. Yeah, so the, the traditional aspect is just the usual, you know, scientific um, investigation. Mm -hmm. um, you go out there, you use the same procedures that other archaeologists are using. And um, explain what those are to me. It's, it's, um, I'd love to hear about what exactly you do. So you, you go out at a site, mm -hmm. you try and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the surface, find the surface indicators. Um, you're going to find, you know, chips of rocks. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out if these are really made by humans. Um, in the past, and once you, you figure that out, um, you, you also want to find out, you know, what else is in the surrounding area. You want to determine how far the site extends. Um, you want to figure out if it's been disturbed, mm -hmm. whether by erosion or cultivation, um, before you can determine if it's, you know, worth excavating. Because you can find a lot of, you know, very interesting things on the surface in, in terms of, you know, cultural remains. Um, but if they've been disturbed, for example, by farming, mm -hmm. then their context is really disturbed and it's not very useful. Really? So mm -hmm. they might be disturbed on the surface, but if you excavated, you wouldn't find anything necessarily? So that's the other thing. You, you, you have to figure out how, how much is a, disturb, is a dis disturbance. Okay. So if it's extensive, then you probably want to rethink about you know, the excavation. Right, okay. um, but once you, you determine that there's, there's a possibility of finding more artifacts, you never know what you're going to find. That's mm -hmm. the exciting part about right. archaeology. Um, you can have the best plans and, you know, sink this big excavation trench and then end up finding nothing mm -hmm. because whatever that was there was only a very small lens on the surface. Um, so you have to set out a test trench mm -hmm. and then in this trench you're going to figure out what lies underneath. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's usually very fascinating because you, you can be around for a couple of weeks looking for all great things that are found on the surface and you don't find them. Right. And then just in the last day, when you have to go back, <laughs> you, you know, you hit the jackpot. Wow. Yeah, and then Very you have exciting. to close shop and, you know. Oh, just, really? So yeah, you do have to? Yeah, because you, you're usually running on timetables, and these timetables are determined by, you know, you have to come back to your job at the uh -huh. end of summer, or your funding ran out, right. or the rains have come, the seasons right. have changed. Okay. Yeah. So then what happens to that site? How long does it go without any work being done? Or do you call in other um, archaeologists from, you know, perhaps other places? Uh, usually um, these investigations require a lot of experts. And so you usually you have a team. Um, you, you're going to have a paleontologist, somebody who studies bones. You may meet somebody who studies plants. You may need a geologist if you're not 
you know, very good in geology yourself. And so it's usually teamwork. Mm -hmm. And so what usually happens is that people go there over the summer or the winter break, and you come in as a team. Okay. Yeah, but um, so you, you go back to, you know, to your institutions, try and find funding, and then mm -hmm. go back again. And a lot of these excavations happen over multiple seasons. Okay, so yeah. how long have you been out there at that site? Um, I was there for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. um, not very long. Um, but we do plan on going back. Okay, yeah, good, I cannot good. wait to go back. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about some of the non-traditional work that you're doing there. The, the, it's it's non-traditional um, in the sense that we are involving the local people, okay. not in the actual excavation, mm -hmm. but um, in, in two ways. We, we we get their help in trying to understand what's happening around the landscape. Okay. They know this landscape extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, when I, would, I was at this site, I looking at, you know, the different types of, you know, rocks that, are, you know, these ancient people are using to make artifacts. And I'm thinking, you know, this could be local because they're using a lot of this. They're not moving it from very far. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to the local person and asked him, you know, is there anything that looks like this nearby? And, you know, we walked, you know, downhill a mile and there was a quarry. There was a huge quarry, uh, which I, I probably never have thought to look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they're also very curious. They're very curious. And we are, you know, they are asking about, you know, these artifacts, who made them, and were they the Maasai? The Maasai are this, you know, pastoralists in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And were they, you know, ancient Maasai? And we tell them we don't think they were mm -hmm. Maasai, but they are, they are definitely your ancestors from a very remote time period. So it's really the involvement of the community in understanding the landscape, but also the other aspect that, you know, this is, you know, cultural material that is found in their backyards and mm -hmm. their farms. and you know, their property. And what has happened before is we would hire a few local people to help in the excavations and saving of the soil and probably as a local guide and to help us sometimes negotiate, you know, local politics. Mm -hmm. But we really did not involve them, you know, in trying to tell them, you know, this is what thing, these things are and this, this is, you know, volcanic glass and somebody brought it in from 35 miles away. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been kind of sad because they're very alienated from, you know, this cultural material that is really part of their heritage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the heritage of all humanity, but um, given that East Africa is the cradle of humanity, but right. um, they're extremely alienated from this, this material. Okay, so yeah. you're bringing them in and kind of involving them and keeping them posted on what's going on. Yes, and there, there's always the worry that if we over-involve them, they might come back and try and excavate the site okay. and, you know, try and pick up the material. Right. But from my experience, when we leave sites alone previously, I mean, these people know we've been there with our trucks and our fancy equipment, and they usually leave the site alone. And if you can explain to them, especially using, you know, the local elders, uh, that, you know, don't touch this material, just, you know, leave it alone. Um, if you touch it, then the context is lost and it's useless. Right. Um, then for the most part, they're, you know, they, they will leave it alone. Okay. But what I find out, they're, they're, they're really curious and interested. Mm -hmm. And it's not really fair to, you know, kind of alienate them sure. from, from I understand. all of this um, very interesting um, history or prehistory. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things you have found at this point? Um, so what was really exciting about this site is we, we are finding um, hand axes, you know. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, we're finding these, um, you know, stone tools that are this, about the size of, of my thumb at the bottom. And this is about a sequence of about, you know, 35 feet of, of sediments. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom we find hand axes, and this really, we suspect this go back from, you know, to maybe as far back as 200,000 years. And then at the very top we are finding things that are about, you know, an inch, you know, arrowheads or points as we call them mm -hmm. in, in African archaeology. And this is a really very nice sequence, that, you know, that shows that, you know, the progression of technology over, you know, very, very long periods of time. And it's, what is also very interesting is you can see them using local material. Mm -hmm. And then with time, they start importing more exotic material that has, you know, better, you know, um, properties. It from gives how, you... Okay, from how far away? Um, right now, we're not quite sure. That's one of the things that we really have to find mm -hmm. out. But with, you know, given my prior experience, you know, with stone tools um, and especially the materials that are used in this area, they, you know, they, they could be as far as, you know, 35, 40 kilometers from the site, mm -hmm. or maybe they could be further away. Because if you look at them visually, you can see this black volcanic rock. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if you look at the edges, you can tell it's from different sources. One is kind of greenish, and um, there's one that is an opaque gray, and then there's one that's all black. Mm -hmm. But you can see that when you start using this volcanic glass, it gives you a very nice cutting edge. Um, the initial um, volcanic glass they're using, it's also called obsidian, it's, it's got all these inclusions. It's not very good quality. And then as you move further to the top, um, to more recent um, times, you see that they're getting very good quality obsidian, and so they must be getting it from far, probably trading it in or traveling further out to find material that is, you know, um, gives you a better working edge. Right. Very yes. interesting. Yeah. So has this helped your research at all in terms of the projectile weaponry? Um, it, it, it's going to be great because if I can actually date um, the arrowheads or the points that we are finding closer to the surface, it's going to give me an idea of you know when these people probably started using um, you know the projectile weaponry, mm -hmm. and then I can compare you know how that has changed. Because what's great about this site is um, we rarely ever find you know a nice sequence that shows you all these changes. Mm -hmm. it may not necessarily be exactly the same people. Maybe the site was you know occupied over and over by different social groups mm -hmm. at different times, and we can see evidence of, of volcanic eruptions very turbulent geological mm -hmm. times. Um, but you, you can really see how t that technology progressed. Right now, we take technology for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my iPhone 5, the 6 is coming out, I don't know, the 7 is coming right. out. But, you know, in past times, you know, those changes were slow and painful. Mm -hmm. But when they happened, they did make a significant impact in, in terms of the survival of, of the people that came up with the technology. I mean, that in itself is very interesting, how technology did change over time. And is there any way to know why that happened? Um, I would imagine that it, it, it had some adaptive value. Mm -hmm. um, we really do not adopt new technology. It really doesn't have any value to, to our life. It doesn't make our lives easier. But having you know that technology is great. So if, Stone tools go back to about 3.3 million mm -hmm. years. And again, this is from Kenya, but not from this particular locality. And if you can imagine you know, your life without anything, any cutting implement, mm -hmm. you just have your nails and teeth. <laughs> as, you know, as we say, um, life can be pretty difficult. We take oh, a lot sure. of these things for granted. But just having that fast cutting edge w was great in itself. Right. Um, so imagine having you know, a, a projector mm -hmm. um, weaponry where you can put distance between yourself mm -hmm. and something that you're hunting, right. something that will probably fight back, or something that runs very quickly, mm -hmm. um, that does give you some advantage. Right. Um, and it, it saves you from injury. If you're injured, you're not, you know, you're not very helpful to your society. Um, and then if you have to chase, if you're using a spear and you have to chase this animal all over the place, it's, you get tired, you use a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. and do you want to maximize, you know, the, the, the amount of calories you, you know, you get from an animal compared to how much, cal you know, calories you, you know, you expended mm -hmm. um, while chasing that animal? So, if you can save the calories, great. You can apply those calories towards, you know, reproduction and other things. So, um, were homo, homo sapiens at that point using fire, or did that come later or much earlier? Um, based on, you know, on finds from other sites, you know, fire has been around for a very long time. So they definitely had fire. Mm -hmm. They definitely had fire. Okay. Yes. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I think what it would be like to, ha to have been that first person way yeah. back then yeah. to have, you know, said, hey, you know, let's cut this stone to make this weapon. I mean, isn't that a fascinating thought? For, I mean, especially for you to think, who would be, you know, that very first person to make that technological change? It, it is fascinating. And when I'm talking to the local people, I, I try and, and, and tell them just, you know, can you, can you imagine being able to make something like this mm -hmm. and using it to, to cut up, you know, things? Or are we just using, a, you know, a blade from, you know, from a stone mm -hmm. to butch up an animal? You know, usually we do these experiments with students and... In the beginning, they're incredibly like, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And once they've done it, they're like, wow, you can actually do that with right. stone tools, and it makes a huge difference. So um, it is very exciting. Yeah. And it's even more exciting when you first just find something that has not been found elsewhere, but it's just the one or two pieces, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, is this an accident? Or is this going to be a trend? And that's why um, excavating this site is important, because 
sites that date back to that transition um, where you actually get Homo sapiens appear. And then the technology that come, comes with that are, are rare. They're extremely rare. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we have to say about this time period is based on just, you know, finds from a few sites. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the, 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 the current um, knowledge is, for most of the time, we, we say things or we make this generalization just based on a few sites, and then later on we find more sites, and then we have to change what we said before. So it's always better when you have more data from more sites. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. So you are, um, you're, are you collaborating with other archaeologists at other sites to kind of help advance the knowledge? of that time period? Um, right now, we I'm working with a team from the museum, and we will definitely bring more people on board once we, you know, we open up a larger excavation. Um, it always makes sense to, to cooperate with people from, mm -hmm. you know, from different sure. disciplines. Okay. And so we will compare what we find with what has been found at a, other sites mm -hmm. um, dating to this time period. They're not that many, but we'll definitely be doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and are they all in Africa? Um, yes, for for the most part, these sites are going to be are going to be in Africa. Okay. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, what it will actually take to know how far back humans, you know, walked the land. For instance, what their environment was like. Was their environment, you know, similar to what it was is today, or was it vastly different? And also, you know, how they lived. Um, that, that's that's a great question because mm -hmm. the, the local people. Are, also asking me the same. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing you do is you are going to, once you excavate um, the site, um, you, you date it. Mm -hmm. um, do you use, is it carbon dating? Is that what it's called? Or is it, um, this is going to be beyond, you know, the, the limits of carbon dating. I, I suspect it's going to be, um, carbon dating right now has a limit of about, you know, 50, 60,000 years. Okay. And I suspect this is going to be older than that. Uh, but we're very lucky in the sense that we have a, you know, these old surfaces that people lived on um, covered by, you know, volcanic ashes. So mm -hmm. people would be living on, you know, on the surface and they would be dropping their, you know, their weapons and some are broken and they would be making some on the same site, on the same, you know, site. And then some eruption would happen mm -hmm. and that, that site would be, you know, that surface would be completely sealed. And then the same people, a different group of people would come by and then do the same thing and another eruption happens and it's, I was thinking about it, just you know how the life of those people must have been. You know, there was very turbulent geological episodes, and so, um, but that's great for us because these sites are sealed, mm -hmm. and a volcanic eruption is, you know, it happens within a fairly short time, so you can date that event, mm -hmm. and so we're going to be using the volcanic um, ashes to to date the sites, okay. and once we figure that out, we can correlate that date to um, global climate. What was going on at that point, you know, globally was it, you know, was the, the northern hemisphere covered in glaciers and that would denote like a global cold period. Mm -hmm. um, or was it a warm period? And then locally, um, you can also find within those th the, the soils, you can, not the ashes, but you know, the, the soils, you can find plant remains. Mm -hmm. You can find plant phytolates. Okay. And you can say, hey, they have, there's trees and grasses here, or there's just grasses. And if you're also very lucky, you may find remains of, you know, small mammals, mm -hmm. um, rats. Um, you may also find things like snails that tell you, well, this was a wet environment. Wow. Yeah, so they, you, we use a lot of proxy data to try and figure out, you know, the, you know, the global climate at that time. And then we look for more local indicators of specific environment of the site. Was there anything that was particularly surprising to you while, you're, while you were working at this site? Um, the, what was really intriguing was just why was this place occupied over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. that, was, that, was, that is, you know, something that is rare and but it's great for us. Mm -hmm. And of course we have to start, one, you know, wondering, did they live here? Did they live someplace else? And talking to the to local people, there was this old guy who told us, well, maybe they lived some caves near the river. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, caves? Why didn't you tell me there are caves mm -hmm. here? So he walked us, you know, about two miles close to the river, and it wasn't exactly a cave. It was a rock shelter, this rock overhang. Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, maybe they lived here. Uh, because we found other sites that were also, you know, found at, you know, such rock shelters. Um, so we plan on involving more people. Mm -hmm. um, 
scientists and, and locals. Yeah. And hopefully we can get a, a clearer picture of what is going on at the site. So moving forward, um, when you go back to the site, ultimately what would be something that you would really love to find there? I would like to, I, I would love to find um, what we really hope for is a good sample size. Mm -hmm. You know, going down to, you know, to, to the oldest layer of that site, that, that transition period when we had, you know, tools that, you know, we can associate with Homo sapiens, the, you know, the previous tools were being made by, you know, by different um, kind of hominid and probably Homo erectus. Um, but we would I like to find, right now we have, you know, we have a few hand axes, but we'd hope for, you know, a bigger sample size so, mm -hmm. so that we know that, you know, we can actually convince people this was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. This has been fascinating for me. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Okay. For more information about Professor Wawaru and her work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Thank you.